Hello, we want to always focus something different today, as we occasionally like to do. And today I'm joined by Ian Finch. He's a BAFTA winning producer and director. And though you might not know his work, you'll have seen it if you've ever watched major sporting events on the BBC, ITV, TNT Sports, including the Olympic Games, the World Cup, Super Bowl, the Euros or Match of the Day. But most importantly, he's a Forest fan. Ian, uh, good morning. How are you doing? I'm all right, thanks. How are you? Yeah, good. Thank you. Good. Um We'll get into all the TV stuff and everything, uh, obviously. But what's your what's your forest story? Is it a family thing? Were you born and raised in the city? How did it all come about that you're a Reds fan? Um, well, I was born in Grimsby. Um, and then my cousins are from Nottingham, so they live in Woolerton. So I've been going to Nottingham all my life. Um, so I've, I, knew, I knew the city quite well and always loved it there. But um didn't really have a team when I was younger, you know, I sort of like watched watched football, but didn't really support anybody as such. I think my dad was going to take me to see Grimsby one day and Leeds came the night before and smashed the town up. So um, it kind of put him off and he was never like a massive football going person. So I never got taken to a game. I don't want people to feel sorry for me. But then I went to college in Southampton and started just going down and watching them at the Dell. Um but didn't really get bitten by the bug, you know. I sort of enjoyed the games, but I didn't really fall in love with Southampton or anything. Uh, then when I was at college, I got meningitis, so I had to take about two months off. And then I had to restart my degree again because I'd, I'd missed too much. So then I went to Nottingham, which is where I always wanted to go anyway, and started watching Forest. And I don't know, just something just clicked straight away. Like The first game I went to was like a two-all draw with Arsenal. And we came out of it. This is in 94, I think. And then I came out of it and just said, let's go again next week, you know. And then it was Ipswich the following week. And just uh, something just instantly felt right, you know. And I've, so I've followed them ever since. I've, I've missed all the glory days, obviously. And um, I thought for a long time I was like a, a bad luck omen as well because we had so many years of being crap. But then, you know, we're getting the rewards now and I hope it just continues. Yeah. Probably thousands of us who thought that we're we're the reason that yeah. uh, it's all gone so wrong. I remember taking my now wife to the playoff semi final first leg against Sheffield United, and then um, I said she couldn't come to a game again until we got promoted after that <laughs> two thousand and three defeat. So she's yeah. not been in twenty years, which she's quite happy about. I think to be honest, my wife's um, always been. She'd never really seen us win. She came to one game with me, and that was when we got promoted from League One on that bizarre day when everything went right. Yeah. Um, but then usually she's just like, why do you put yourself through it? You know that Luton game when we were 2 0 up? Yeah. She was just like, she saw me like distraught. She goes, why do you put yourself through it? And I'm like, well, you've got to have the lows to, you know, to enjoy the highs, haven't you? So I think if you're like a City fan or a Liverpool fan, it can't be the same when you win, can it? Because you're no. so used to winning. You could, you've, I think you've got to be miserable most of the time to enjoy the, the high points, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, oh, yeah, watching Man City games this season or any season, and it's so quiet unless they're playing. Oh, that Chelsea anything. game was good, but yeah, you know, oh, we've just scored against Burnley, rah rah. It's like, oh, mm. I, I, yeah, I kind of would be a bit bored supporting them, uh, and I find their football a bit boring as well now these days. But anyway, that's a different conversation. Um, you've got a great career. Um, how did you get into it? It's, you know, obviously you've done really well for yourself, but how did you get that TV bug? Um, well, I always, as a kid, I wanted to be like a, a Radio 1 DJ, like Papa Doodle Do. So I always wanted to do telly or radio or something. So I'd always been fascinated by that. And then when I was at university in Nottingham, for our dissertation, we had to either write 15,000 words, which I'm useless at because I do a word count and I've only been, done 10,000. So I just go back and put loads of adjectives in, you know. And it was either that or you could make a film. So I decided to make a film about how the Taylor Report had changed safety at grounds following Hillsborough. So I got in touch with Forrest and um, Frank Clark in, um, got me down there and I did an interview with him. Um, and I did like filming behind the scenes for the day, uh, post-match interviews with players and things like that. And then finished the film, sent it off to the BBC, never heard anything, sent it off to Sky. And they um, said, come in and we want to have a chat with you. And they gave me a job off the back of it. And that was a Derby fan that gave me that job. So it must have been a, quite a good video. <laughs> um, I don't want you to blow your own trumpet, obviously, but I was saying uh, you've you've won a, a, a BAFTA, um, which is amazing. Can you just give viewers and listeners some context of to kind of what stuff you've worked on then uh, throughout your career? Uh, yeah, so I was at Sky for two years, 
then I went to BBC and I was there for 19 years until I went freelance. And at the Beeb, I sort of did, I've done six World Cups, six Euros, a couple of Olympic Games, and then um, Super Bowl every year since, what, 2008. And then as a freelancer, I still do NFL and I do uh, match a day. But then I also do things like Champions League for TNT. I was doing that this week and some Premier League for them as well. And then I do like non-sporty stuff as well. So in two weeks, I'm doing Crofts, which is always a good laugh. Um, hence the dog behind me. Um, and then um, there's a, a region, there's a show made in Manchester called Morning Live, which goes out after breakfast on BBC One. So I'm doing a bit of that next week. So yeah, a bit of everything really. Gosh. Um, I mean, obviously it sounds great. And everyone says my job sounds great. But there are highs and lows of every job. I mean... You know, you must travel the world a lot, which is is great. Is it it's probably not a family friendly job? I guess is it? No, like if you go to a major tournament, you're away for six weeks, which is um, you have to have a very understanding, forgiving family. Really, I mean, I've got two kids. One of the reasons I went freelance was just because I was I was working up every weekend, and I wanted to be in control of my days. Really, so I try not to work as many weekends anymore. Um, but yeah, those big events you're away for a long time and even now I'm I'm away I was away for three nights this week in London for Champions League because I live in Manchester so yeah it's it's tricky but it's just as a freelancer you can try and balance your own diary a bit more and try and hopefully see the kids a bit more I suppose the flip side of that is though you know the kid from Grimsby has now traveled to I don't know South Africa Germany Korea, I'm trying to think where Olympics and World Cups have been, but Brazil, yeah. you've seen the world. I mean, what are some of the most memorable uh, trips and tournaments that you've covered? Um, I think Brazil World Cup was pretty good, even even despite the fact English were, England were rubbish. Um, mm. We had a sort of a, a budget hotel, but it was right on the beach at Ipanema, so it was like it wasn't bad waking up to that every day for six weeks. And those and they're really they're a really good t uh, team out there as well. So. Every, you know, you do the shows, but then everybody's out every night and enjoy themselves, you know. So they're, they're good trips to be on. Um, and probably the most memorable game I've worked on was the England 5, Germany 1. Me and my mate Coley did replays for that. But, you know, it sounds glamorous that you go into all these events, but generally you're sat in a truck in the car park, so you don't really get to be right, right at the heart of it. And I've managed to do a couple of Forest games as well. So I did the... Uh, the game where we beat Leicester in the FA Cup last year, that was amazing because, you know, you didn't know what to expect. And then it's just trying to, I thought, well, I'll try and keep it, keep the tone down, you know, whenever we score. But I didn't, I just lost it every time. Screamed in poor old Mark Chapman's ear, you know. Um, and then I did the game against Arsenal for TNT the other week as well, which didn't go as well. But it's great just to get, to be able to wander around the city ground and have a little wander up the tunnel with your pass, you know, it's great. Little added bonus. What is the, the job uh, basically that you do then? Because I've been, I remember years ago, I took a tour of the Sky Truck uh, mm -hmm. uh, test match, and there's so many cameras and so many people. And um, yeah. what, in layman's terms, what is it that you actually do as the producer or the director, depending which which hat you got on? Uh, yeah, well, there's generally, if it, for example, match of the day, there's three people talking in Gary Lineker's ear. One is the program editor, and he sort of discusses what they talk about and how long they're going to talk about it and, you know, the sort of the key points, really. Then there's the PA who does all the timings, and she makes sure that they keep on time, and she tells the editor when they're, when they're up, the, the time's up, and they've got to move on. And then there's me that basically tells them what camera to talk to, and then I do – I float in all the VTs, and I sort of – um send a list of graphics of all the images you want in the studio so i sort of direct the cameras and um and then when you're on an ob as well you, you'll have extra things you'll have match cameras so you, you're shooting warm-ups and picking out players and things like that and then queuing the commentators but then when the actual, the actual match happens it's generally somebody else actually cutting the game itself i do all the the pre pre-game the half time and the full time mm. it's um I mean, I was covering cricket and it's well, watching cricket and it seemed chaotic and that's pretty slow and sedate sport. But yeah. in the heat of the battle when it's football, it, I mean, it must be, is it all, all go or is it kind of an adrenaline rush as well? Uh, being, you know, saying, do this, do that, do this, do that to everyone. Yeah, it can be. I mean, 
especially when you're doing like TNT, like half time, you've only half time lasts two and a half minutes because of the ad breaks they've got to get in. So it's just you basically come out that ad break and it's just bang straight into first analysis, then the next, then the next, and then you throw into another break. So it's but but their their, their build ups tend to be sort of an hour long. Whereas mm. if you do a live game for match a day, you probably only get fifteen minute build up. But so it's it can vary, you know. But it's uh yeah, it's good fun. I mean, you get that adrenaline kick every time. Like when I come back from doing match a day, I can't get out of bed. I'll just sit up and have a beer or a glass of wine. I'll sit up till two in the morning because you're still sort of buzzing a bit, even after all these years, you know. That was one thing I was going to ask you, Mary. I mean, you uh, you work with some big names, obviously Gary Lineker, Alan Shearer, Darren Fletcher, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Exactly. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I remember, I don't really get starstruck now. I was trying to think the last person I got starstruck interviewing, and it might be Stuart Broad, years ago when I was doing cricket a lot. Um, mm -hmm. Has that worn off for you now, even though you're meeting England football legends week after week? Yeah, I think it was it was weird the first time when I was new at um, BBC and I went to work on Football Focus and Lineker was presenting at the time. And just to walk into the Tuesday meeting and seeing like, the guy you'd watch bang all these goals in for England for years sat at a table. So that was a that was a weird one at first. Now I went on my first ever OB, which was Blackburn. I think they were qualifying for the Champions League. So that shows you how long ago that was. Um, and after the game, um, everybody stayed up far too long in the bar. And I went to bed thinking, oh, there's no way I'm going to make breakfast. But I thought, well, I'm the new kid. I've got to turn up for breakfast. It'll, it'll look bad. So I got up. And I was the only one who got up apart from Des Lynham and John Motson. So I ended up having brekkie with them too. And it was just, that was a bit of a, you know. But generally, I don't really, you know, I don't really get starstruck as such. You know, I think I would if I met like Dave Grohl or something like that. But it's uh, but as far as football is concerned, you meet so many of them. It's like, yeah, it's no problem really. Excellent, excellent. Um, we will talk about match of the day then, but before we do that, uh, let's just give a plug for our sponsors, the Trent Navigation, as ever. Uh, Sunday uh, is obviously Sunday roast, where you get uh, locally sourced meat, but also uh, in the evening, 7pm, there's a quiz every Sunday, which I think we might go to, or we're talking about getting a team together, because I think Greg goes regularly. Uh, I think the prize is currently 175 quid, the jackpot. But yeah, we'll hopefully go down there ourselves one day. So thanks as ever to the Trent Navigation for their sponsorship. Right. Um, one of the this came about sort of because of match the day at the weekend when uh, Nico Williams' penalty wasn't discussed. And I saw you on Twitter trying to explain mm -hmm. um, why it wasn't. So we'll get to that. But obviously, match of the day, the running order, the discussions, what the pundits say, seems to be like one of the most talked about things on Saturday night. I just wanted to break that all down. But how does match of the day work um, from start to finish in terms of uh, do the pundits watch like one game here, one game on another screen there? Or they go back and watch it later. Just how do they actually see the matches and all that kind of stuff, first of all? Um, so we've got a production room which has got loads of big screens um some of them are like you know quad splits or whatever but we've we've got all the games on there so um everybody will get in in time for the early game and um both pundits will watch that and they've got two analysis producers with them as well all day um and then say for the three o'clock games they're all up there i mean we will sort of decide beforehand like which games the uh pundits are going to focus on but they'll take two or three each you know so they'll have we'll assign the screen so that it's all in their eye line and so everybody's sort of watching everything and occasionally you'll just get like a shout of like goal and it's like where where you know you're just trying to find out where the goal is so all the games are, are watched and the analysis producers are making notes um and then at half time they'll have a little discussion about what their thinking is you know for example on saturday I was saying, well, it's quite obvious that Tavares and Hudson Odoi are doing, you know, linking really well on the left. So that's where all the danger seems to be coming at the moment. So, you know, they start making a few notes and start pulling a few things together. And then the second half, luckily that continued. So they were able to make a piece out of that. But sometimes they might focus on a player at half time and then it's, they might not do anything in the second half. So they have to change their analysis. And then at the end of each game, um, they just have a discussion with a program editor and they decide what analysis runs they're going to do, really. Hmm. So is it all quite that, collaborative or or do you yeah, find yeah. 
yeah, sometimes like you're saying, oh, we we need two more minutes of Forest because of like with your own bias, maybe you know, yeah. where we need more of this and more of that, and or does it all come no. together quite seamlessly in the end? Well, things. My role is the director, so I direct what they want to put on the screen. So I, even though I will chip away at the editor and say, oh, you know, have a old uh, Murillo's looking good today or whatever. He's, <laughs> you know, he, he generally takes it with a pinch of salt because he knows that obviously I'm, you know, he doesn't hear me pushing Palace players or things like that. So yeah, yeah. So I don't necessarily have much say in what is discussed, but I will try and push it a little bit if I can. Uh, and then after all the games. Um, the guys will have something to eat. They'll go through, they'll look at the analysis, um, run through it about nine o'clock. That's when I go into the studio, check all the images that we've prepared to make it sure, you know, place all the graphics, make sure it all looks good. Lineker will come in about half nine. Um, we'll record like the links for the morning repeat, um, do his trail, which goes out just before the news. And then we'll rehearse. Guys are getting about 20 past quarter past 10, and then you go live. And then when the show is actually on, while we're showing the match edits, because we've seen all the games, we don't need to see them again. So we just at that point, we run through the runs of analysis and Gary will say, right, well, I'll say to you who you're focusing on today. And then the pundits will sort of run through their analysis so we know exactly what they're going to talk about. Um, and then when the show is actually happening, sometimes things can run long, things can go over, and that's where analysis starts getting squeezed and chopped. And that's what happened with... Nico and um, Calvin Phillips on Saturday. We did that nice run on Tavares and um, Hudson Adoy, but there was like the, there was no more time to actually do any more. And I think because the game was one two nil, even though it was annoying and everybody knew it should have been a pen for Nico, it didn't affect the result of the game, which was the argument was given back to me when I was going, "You've got to do Nico," but. Yeah, so it's frustrating at times when you can't, we haven't got the time to talk about everything. Whereas on match day two, you get six or seven minutes out of every game. Whereas on Saturday, sometimes if you're at the back end of the program, you might only get a minute and a half or even a minute. So it's it's a tricky balance. And nobody's, I, I doubt West Ham fans were happy either because we didn't do the red card. And some people have suggested that it might have been a little soft. So, you know, you can't win really, can you? No, no, true. How's the running order decided then? Because if sometimes it looks like to fans, oh, it's always Man United or it's always the big club. Is it? Is it? Is that? You know, cynically, is that a factor because more fans of those clubs are watching, or is it more like, oh, these are just the most entertaining games? Let's let's put this one up. It's it's gen it's genuinely a mix of what is the best game and also the story. So, for example, this Saturday gone, all three title contenders were playing at three o'clock, which is or sorry, all playing on a Saturday, which is quite rare, really. So even though the City game was a draw, because you'd shown the other two, it was just basically a chronological thing of this is what's happened in the title race. And then the next game, I think, was Wolves-Tottenham, which obviously Wolves, good result for them, win the way. Then it was us. Um, and I think, was it Newcastle were down near the end of the show? I'm not sure. But, yeah, it tends to be a mix of the best game hence it being called match of the day and also what's happening whether it's a, a title race or it's a relegation battle you know and draws tend to be at the end of the show because we like people winning games of football i suppose as forest fans we want to be at the end of the show because boring mid-table games with not so much on the line are probably the way you want to be yeah. in our situation and if you've got so. kids you get a line on a sunday morning because you don't have to get up for the start of the show Bonus. True. Um, yeah, but then, the, but the running order is dictated to by program editor. He'll he'll decide the running order, and then he'll run it by Gary. And Gary might go, mm, you know, I, I think that one should be above that one, and they'll have a discussion. But yeah, again, I'm doing a little nudge in the ribs, but it, I don't get anywhere. Does each game get a set amount of time every week? Then, so obviously, the first game is that like, okay, we're going to have seven minutes highlights, interviews, five minutes of analysis, and then it dwindles down from there. Is that? Is there a set structure in that sense then? Um, yeah, the, well, the better the game is, the more time it will be given, you know, and mm. producers, there's a producer assigned to each edit and they will speak to the program editor and say, look, I, I've got another couple of chances here. I'm desperate to get in. Can I have another 30 seconds? So it's quite a flexible thing. I mean, there will, I mean, the running order for this weekend, for example, there, there might be an order in there of what you think the best games are, but then, 
it can get completely turned on its head. You know, sometimes like a Manchester derby, it can be hyped up to like beyond all recognition and it can be an absolute dud. And I've seen games like that be last on the show. So it, it, it's basically whatever, whatever, how good the games are, dictate the running order, really. Mm-hmm. I wasn't didn't think of this before I asked you, but do you know how FA Cup games are decided then as well? Because that's another source of gripe for fans. Is that who makes those decisions? Um, people way above my pay grade. Um, <laughs> I, I, and and there's also it flip flops between ITV and BBC who gets first pick. Mm. And then there's also other factors involved, as in the police won't sanction games at a certain time, um, just because. You know they've got they've got another event on in the same city or something like that. So, I mean, we're on the telly on Wednesday, aren't we? Uh, I don't know actually if we yeah. are. Man United oh, game. Oh, it's on BBC. Excellent, excellent. Are you doing that one? No, nah. I'm doing morning live the next morning, so I've got to be up at five. <laughs> I'll be watching it there. Don't worry. Uh, last one on TV before we get into a bit of forest chat. I mean, do you kind of just? I don't want to blow smoke up Lineker's ass and uh, the other guy, Mark Chapman, who I think is great as well. But the the job they do, I think, is is really impressive. I've got one gripe about Lineker, which I'll tell you, and it's not <laughs> political, obviously. But the job they do, I think, it's really impressive, like because it's so fast moving, uh, and Chapman on Mark Chapman on the radio is great as well. I mean, you must just be. Uh, this is such a softball question, but you must be really impressed with just how good they are at it, in a sense. Yeah, yeah, they're great. Chappers lives just down the road from me over here, actually. He's a lovely guy. No, they're both really good. They're, it's just that they're, they're the sort of presenters you can just, you know, you don't almost, you don't need to direct because they're just so good at it. Like Claire Balding as well, for example, you can just point a camera and she'll just go off and you can go for a cup of tea. She's that good, you know, but yeah, they're, but they're both great at the job and Chappers is just like encyclopedia on every sport, isn't he? I used to do the um, American football with him. And he was just so good on that. He just knew all the ins and outs. No, they're great. Let me tell you my one that could gripe. Go on, uh, he, um, I'll text him. Please. <laughs> <laughs> Arsenal have just won 5 0. And I spoke with Mikel Arteta after the game. And he always speaks to the manager who's had the absolute tonking win for the most easy interview you can get. Uh, that's my only gripe with Gary Lineker. It's like, oh, here's Vincent Company after we just got absolutely battered again. Vincent, why haven't you been sacked yet? That's kind of my my only yeah. drive with Gary Lineker. But they're not going. They're not going. They're not going to get thumped five 0 and then come out for a chat, are they? No, no, I know. Because they're I just, know. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah. You, I mean, basically, with those those two ways, you can only really do them on the games where we're in control of them. Because on the Saturday, BBC will do two or three of those three o'clock games, and Sky will do the other ones. So. It pretty much has to be a BBC OB that we can we can request a two way really. Good. So let's move yeah. on to some forest chat. I know Emily told me to go really hard at you on match of the day, and I don't know if I really did. So I might have the wrath of her on WhatsApp afterwards. See, I'm not in charge of it. I just come in and point the cameras. I tell you, but I do fight for Forest. I promise you. I, I sit at home when I'm not working on it, and I get frustrated like the rest of you. You know, when Bolly got sent off, hmm. and that I think there was some joke that was made about oh maybe you just wanted christmas off and i was like <laughs> i went in and i complained i went in on boxing day and i said to the editor i told i said that really pissed me off that did and he was just like oh he's so touchy he's so sensitive <laughs> you know and when danilo, danilo didn't get in goal of the month this month as well i've complained about that so yeah i do fight forest corner but there's 19 other teams that they've got to worry about as well so they can't just favor us all the time true True. Well, I thought it was really interesting insight, so thank you very much for that, Ian. Um, how are you feeling about the season then in terms of where we're heading? It seems to have flipped week to week. Or like We lose to Newcastle, it's doom and gloom. This is mm-hmm. me as well, well. And we beat West Ham and we're all feeling good. And now we're just worried about FFP points deductions. Um, but how are you feeling in general about the season? Yeah, I think that's it, isn't it? We just, because we don't know what's going on with the FFP thing. It's just you don't know how many points you're going to need. I think... If that wasn't a factor, I think we'd be absolutely fine, especially now things seem to be turning a bit of a corner. I mean, that front four we've got are just smashing it every week. They're amazing. And then Murillo and Felipe together were amazing on the weekend. Cell seems to have um, given everybody a bit of calm and composure at the back, whereas every time the ball went back to poor old Turner before, 
you could sense the panic, couldn't you? It was so. I think, yeah, I think I, it's, it. I think we'll we'll know a lot more when Everton's appeal is finally announced, which was due this week, isn't it? At some point, because that'll give a sense of if we were to get any points docked, how you know what we could get it reduced to by appeal. I mean, I think the the fairest thing because it looks it looks as if it was. It, it, we haven't like broken the rules massively, have we? It's just it's that sort of move in the Brennan transfer to when you can get an extra 17, 18 million pounds, which makes sense to me. So I think the fairest option would maybe sort of a financial sort of wrap on the knuckles and maybe a suspended points thing. And basically by saying, well, if you do it again in two years, we'll apply the points deduction, but suspend them for now. Yeah, it's so hard to know, isn't it? Because I really want to the, the, get the result of this Everton appeal. Because mm. if it's reduced, then it makes me much more comfortable that Forrest yeah. will get a lower sanction. But if it's not reduced, and then Everton are getting more points thrown at them, then it makes me really worried we're going to get something mad like 10 points. And then I'm really worrying. But then if Everton get more, and we can still finish above Burnley and Sheffield United and Everton. Yeah, my worry, my worry is more about next season. Because if you look at the three that are probably going to come up, they're the three that went down last year. And um, they've obviously got the parachute payments, so they they can still be investing in their squad. They kept most of their team together. They've got that Premier League experience. We can't rely on three teams being crap like we we kind of we. If we stay up this year, having not played brilliantly, we'll have I think we'll have kind of got away with it because of the three teams below us. I don't think you can rely on that, especially not next year. So I'd hope that we start to push on a bit. Yeah, I think that's fair. Uh, I know a few few Leicester fans who say their team, they would say this, but they, they say their team's better than it was last season. I'm not sure if yeah. that's right, they've lost Madison and Tielemans, but I've also heard Leeds fans say the same. So how far away do you think we are then from a mid-table Premier League team in terms of the 11? Are you so like, oh, seven of our 11 are mid-table players, or is it a bit further away than that, do you think? I think it's. I think we're not that far away, you know. It's just, it's because... It tends to be just like silly mistakes, doesn't it? And like um, set pieces that are costing us. Um, I think if everybody plays to their to their maximum ability, like they did at West against West Ham and like they did against Villa and against United, well, that dodgy goal aside, and Newcastle away, then I can see no reason why we can't be, you know, nudging the top half of the table you know it's just not this season necessarily but if if it all comes together next year well i mean we're not that far away if you look at the the start in 11 there aren't many holes are there there's not there's not many spots where you think oh we desperately need a better left back or we desperately need a, a better defensive midfielder it all seems to be there i think the tools are there to do the job I think you're right. I'm interested to see how Matt Sells goes and hopefully, so far so good, but hopefully he answers the goalkeeping question for next season. Yeah, um, probably doing another field striker field. as well. Though, I think I, I was kind of surprised. I know we brought in Ribeiro, but I, I was quite surprised that um, they didn't go for another striker just because without Tywo, we're a little light, aren't we? Especially with Chris Wood being injured. Yeah, it'd be really interesting in the summer. I was talking to someone who said uh, they think we should put almost all our budget into buying a, a top striker mm -hmm. even with Taiwo because they don't trust him to stay fit so that's yeah that's an interesting question and I think we'll see loads of turnover in defense uh in the summer I mean I think Moreno will be here next year but you know, I think so. three of the back four will be different next year because that's the forest way but yeah that midfield that attack is to me is like where we need to be I mean, how are you feeling about specifically the next two games? Because we've got Villa on Saturday and then the FA Cup. I haven't really discussed the FA Cup yet. I mean, are you really uh, are you getting a, an interest in it now in terms of going all the way to Wembley? Because we've been so focused on relegation. But uh, mm. does you know does the FA Cup interest you now? We get a little yeah. bit further in the competition. Yeah, I just I just don't want it to get in the way of the league form. For example, mm. when we had that replay against Bristol City. Knowing that you had Newcastle three or four days later, you knew that the players were going to be knackered, especially having gone to extra time again. Um, so yeah, I mean, and, and Villa as well. I mean, just we've obviously done them once this season. I, I think had we not beaten West Ham, I wouldn't be as confident. But I think we can go there and get something. Mm. I don't see any reason why not. We've got we've certainly no. got the firepower to do it. It's just again, it's just being switched on at the back, isn't it? 
Yeah, those XG stats that have come out recently around, you know, we are actually really secure at the back apart from uh, set pieces, um, mm. yeah, which do count. Uh, it's a bit like the government saying crime's gone down apart from fraud. But anyway, um, yeah. <laughs> which, and all of that was them. <laughs> That's Sorry, not the view of this awesome. podcast. No, no, that's fine. <laughs> not necessarily the view of this podcast, certainly. Um, uh, <laughs> that's funny. Um, yeah, I was going to ask a couple of other quick questions around Forest. I mean, if you were, this is really effectively who's your favourite player, but if you were producing a highlight reel of uh, any of the Forest players, which ones would you want to make an all singing, all dancing song about? Which ones really are you a big fan of? We don't want to sing about them too much because somebody else will nick them. I mean, yeah. Murillo is exceptional, isn't he? That tackle on Antonio was like it was like Bobby Moore, wasn't it? It was that was it was so good. Yeah, so Murillo is fantastic. Um, Gibbs White, I love. He frustrates me at times when he does a little flick when he could do a nice simple ball. Um, Hudson the is coming into his own, isn't he? He's sort of he's he's flying. I might put him on my fantasy team this week, actually. He's he's got isn't he? Has he got like he's one of the top five scorers in the past three weeks or something? I might drop him in. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And Alanga's been a, a revelation as well, hasn't he? And then the, the pace of that boy is unbelievable. It's just like seeing him sprint down the down the field is something else. And Ty, obviously, we love him. I could I could name them all. You know, I think there's there's nobody now we've got Bend of Shelby. There's there's nobody that I that I don't like. You know, so it's it's, it's yeah. a good team. I think Tywo might come into my my fancy team soon, but um, yeah, I like then Hudson Adoy and Ilanga. Mm. I mean, when Ilanga arrived, I just thought he's going to be um, slightly erratic bench option for six months, and then we'll see how he goes. But he's really surprised me. You you, you probably saw quite a lot of him actually doing TV for Man U and Champions League stuff. Has he surprised you how much he stepped up? Yeah, we didn't really get a sniff properly at United, did he? He's just he's one of them players that was overshadowed. And I mean, when we signed him, it's like, well, you know, it's only 15 million, isn't it? And he'll be he didn't seem like a like a direct replacement for Breno, did he? He's like you didn't think that he would be up to his level. But I think as far as like assists and goals, he's he's surpassed what Brennan did last year, hasn't he? So mm. I think he's yeah, he's he's been an absolute steal, really. Hmm. The transfer coverage is interesting. I mean, working in the media, um, what do you think the media, what do you make of what the media make of us? Do they see mm. us as a bit of a funny oddity, do you think, with all the signings and the larger than life owner and all that kind of thing? Do the media really get us? Because the Forest fans get uh, a gripe that um, it's all a bit ill informed and, you know, they just, the pundits just watch the big six clubs and say what, a, say some stuff about us without really researching it. I'm not asking you to speak yeah. to the whole media, but what's your take on the way we're covered uh, in the wider broadcast and, and written press? Yeah. Well, I think last year they just expected us to go down, didn't they, with, with a whimper. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that just sort of like put a, people, a few people's noses out, just the fact that we actually went for it and we're trying to be ambitious. And I don't see why why people should be ridiculing that you know and i think a lot of it might be down to jealousy like the fact that we've got an ambitious owner and he's spending money and there's a lot of clubs out there that you know their their owners aren't going out there into the market and splashing all this cash you know so yeah there's a de degree of jealousy in it and also yeah it's just like you never hear the positive side of it do you the fact that i didn't colin frey say something like since the end of last season forest have either uh, terminated contracts, loaned out or sold more than forty players. Hmm. And like, and everybody's going, "Oh yeah, Forrester buying all these players." Well, hang on a minute, we've balanced the squad as well. So, yeah, it's. I, I wouldn't let it. I wouldn't let it bother you. To be honest, it's like let's just get on with our job and sneak up that table. And you know, the, I mean, the, the tension's always on the big six, isn't it? And if you look at the back page, back pages of the papers. It's always about City or United or Liverpool or Chelsea. Like, we never get a mention, do we? So I think it's just it's like that across the board, really. Yeah, and the January window was encouraging. Um, I thought yeah. we we made sensible deals, and I <clears throat> I was a bit skeptical when they went in for two brack pom. But then when you realise Chris Wood's injured for two months, you can see mm -hmm. actually it's the owner trying to give us some firepower where we might have needed it because. Um, 
I don't really see Divo Carigi making a difference necessarily. I know he had no, that lovely, at the weekend. lovely little flick, isn't it, for that goal? It was. I think Nico made it better than it was because he absolutely ran through. Um, was it a Gerd? I don't know. But yeah, it was interesting. It was interesting. Right. We give anyone a little platform for final words normally. So uh, any final words from you, Ian, before we depart? Anything you want to add? Um, if I can plug one thing. Yes. Um, I do a two-hour show on a radio station called Happy Radio, Sunday afternoons, four till six. Um, loads of like old tunes. So this week it's 78 and 76. But it's on Happy Radio. It's on DAB across the Northwest, and you can get it on your smart speaker. Play Happy Radio, Sunday at four. With me. Excellent. Uh, so you never gave up on the, the DJ dream? I always did it as a little aside, yeah. So it's... Um, Yes, yeah, it's just good fun. It's not it's not like a money spinner or anything. It's just good fun doing it. And I can just, oh, it's the music, I get to pick all the music I want, so there's no interference. It's just I record the show, send it off to them, and then generally it goes out while I'm working match a day two. Oh, brilliant. That's lovely. Oh, good, to hear, good to hear that. Right, uh, as ever, if you have uh, enjoyed this, do us a favour, hit like, hit subscribe. Consider becoming a channel member if you want and give us uh, a five-star review on iTunes and Spotify. That would be great. We are back tomorrow uh, post-match after the Villa game with uh, Mark and Mikey and then Monday with uh, Prutz, Greg and Temps at 11 a.m. and we'll discuss whatever comes out of the Villa game and turn the page a little bit to Man United. So do join us for that. Ian, it's been great to have you on. Thank you very much. No problem. Thanks for doing your podcast, by the way. I love it. Every dog walk I do, there's the little boy. I've always got your podcast on, so and I will become a member. There you go. Oh, everybody, you. sign thank up, you. sign up. Thank you very much. Right, we shall leave it there. Uh, have a good day, everyone, and we shall see you tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>